Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Come and bless the Lord, somebody. Let's honor the Lord for our pastors. Come on, let's honor the Lord for the man. Come on, come on. Amen. Let's honor the Lord for our pastors in the house. I was told by some of my dear friends, I was told by some of my dear friends that they, I have some dear friends that are business people. I uh, live on the northern side, that I think past downtown on the other side. And they said, like, they, said like, they, they are children. Uh, they have got teenagers about maybe 18 going down. They said they have never. They told the mom, dad, we have never been. And they take them everywhere to conferences because they have the money to do that. They do that all of it's because then they love their family. They are very closely needed. And the children said, we've never heard worship like that ever in our life. So I know, come on somebody, because sometimes you don't know what you have and sometimes you take for granted what you have. And as a man who travels the nations, definitely this worship is another level. Praise God. So it's an honor again. My wife, doesn't she look beautiful? My beautiful Filipino. By the way of New York. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I thank you. And I want to thank God for everybody in our church here at New Covenant that worked at King's Conference. Put your hands together for yourself because you guys were amazing. The media team, the worship team, my God. You know, the guys outside, it just was amazing. I was just really amazed. So I'm so thankful. God, I'm in the right place. And then upstairs, we are, we are, almost, we are building the studios. When we are done, we, it's going to be great. You're, you're going to see a lot of people come here to, to film with us and then end up in the house one or the other. So you're going to see people. You're going to see a lot of amazing people come here. <laughs> Amen. So with that said, tonight, I, I took this morning... I want to talk about two books that I want to uh, church to. If you don't have these books in your library, you are actually sinning against God. <laughs> but your sins can be forgiven at my book table after the service. Am I not merciful? <laughs> uh, uh, there are two books that I've really, of all the books I've written, these books have just taken off like rockets. One of the books is called Issuing Divine Restraining Orders from the Courts of Heaven. It has, be, it has been a bestseller on Amazon again and again. I mean, top number one bestseller, beating some of the biggest names. You know, hey, listen, when your book is ahead of Joyce Meyer, you are doing good. Come on, somebody. Because that girl is powerful. Amen. But that's the kind of stuff that's happening with this book, Issuing Divine Restraining Orders. It's loaded with prayers of activation, prayers to restrain the devil and his mother-in-law from coming into your house. Amen. So, <laughs> amen. So, it's there. But, uh, and then this book, um, um, some of you, uh, if you, have, if you have access to YouTube, I want to challenge you at some point today to look, type into the search engine of YouTube, Sid Roth, Francis Miles. The, I did uh, uh, a show with him that's almost, I think probably they've reached a million views in three days now. I, I, we did, um, a, a, we did, uh, I did a thing with him on two November surprises. So that's what I'm going to say. It, it's under, it's when you see the, the one that says two November surprises, that's me and Sid Roth. Please watch it, share it, because I believe it's about, I, I believe, because I, as you share it, I believe that we can grab hold of what God wants to do for America. Because I'm telling you what, I, the devil is a liar. The devil is not going to take America. America is going to experience a revival like we've never seen before. Come on, if you want a revival for America, give God some praise for that. So that interview, part of that interview meanders into this book that just came out. Last, yesterday was the first time the books were made available to the public. So I'm going to be signing these books. The Battle of Altars. The Battle of Otters, Spiritual Technology for Divine Encounters. And so this book is available for you guys. So what I promised during the conference, 
I said, I'm going to talk to you something very important, something that's changed my life. If you are one of those people who are tired of struggling, paying your bills in the house, then you are in the right place. Come on, somebody. Can I show you? How many would like to know how to pay your bills without increasing your salary? Oh, come on. You see, if you think that you can only pay your bills by salary, then you don't know the kingdom of God. And that's why many of you are under so much stress because everything you do, every financial challenge in your house is met by salary. So when the enemy defeats you by salary, you are stuck. You have nothing, you have no place to go. Then you and your wife begin to fight because financial, can, financial pressures can make people act funny. And I'm going to give you a mystery. Of how to have your, all your bills paid on time. Ahead of time. There's an economy of God. Okay. And I believe that's why you're here. But not only that. It's how to increase. The same thing that can help you pay your bills on time. Can bring you into your promised land. And so I want to teach you about how to build. A personal altar in your home and your business. A personal altar. In your home and your business. Now I'm aware that some of you may not understand what an altar is. Even though every Sunday you come towards an altar. When the pastor said come to the altar. As a matter of fact many of you if you are born again. The chances are 99% of the. If you got born again in the chances. If you got born again in the church. The chances are you are called to, to accept Christ at the altar. How many receive Jesus at the altar? So don't tell me that altars cannot change people. You came to an altar, a drunkard, and you left saved, born again and filled in the Holy Ghost. That's the power of altars. They are places of exchange where divinity is given legal access to humanity and they meet at a place of meeting, a tent called, a, called, called divinity. And that, come on somebody, and at the altar, amen, you, I mean, I remember when I, when I came to the altar, 1989, I heard a great man of God speak, Sky Banda is now in, Afri in heaven. He went to heaven five years ago. And he was my first pastor. My God, my God, he preached the message. You know, he was, I mean, I thought he was the black, he was the black Jimmy Swaggart. Come on somebody. He was the same as a God. That was a time when Jimmy Swaggart was still big. And so he meant, he meant he preached though. And I remember running to the altar. He said, come as you are, stinky, dirty. It doesn't matter. I'm like, are you, sure? are you kidding me? I've done so many things. I mean, he said, come as you are. And I said, you mean there is a place where I can come as I am, smelly with all the guilt I have. And you're promising me I'm going to walk away. Who can make that promise? You, I'm going to walk away. Within this service, he was so confident that if I just left the back of the church where I was sitting, run to the altar, give my life to Jesus, he guaranteed me when I leave, I'll feel like a brand new man. He was too good, too good. But he found it too good to believe when, you, when you, you are ravaged by guilt and the things you've done and the things you've been given access to. All the witchcraft that I was exposed to, at, even at a young age, all the stuff. I'm like, God, are you sure? You know, but I heard something. Hope rose in my heart. You know, I was calling. I have no understanding at the time that altar, that the altar of God was calling me. And they told me that I ran. I don't even remember running. They said, boy, you ran. He says, you ran towards the altar like a monkey looking for the banana. Come on, somebody. You know how that is. I ran and I got to the altar and all I know is at the cross my sins were washed away. All I know is that when I turned, I felt a weight lift off me. I'm telling you, it, it was like a thousand tons of, of weight. Sin has a weight. Sin has a weight. It can be put on the scales. It has a weight. And I felt so light. I felt so light. Joy. I couldn't explain the joy. I felt great about my, I mean, it's like even the flowers look nice. Things that passed before you know, do, that looked ordinary now look supernatural. I was so happy because I had changed. It was at an altar. At an altar. So altars consistently in the Bible 
play the role of being platforms of exchange. Where I can exchange my house bills for time spent with God on the altar. Oh, I don't know. Somebody's going to catch this before I leave. So that if instead of my bills talking to me for hours, I decide I could talk to my bills, try to figure out to pay them for the next three hours, or I can take three hours and give it to the altar and see what the altar does with the bills. The mystery of altars. Altars are so important until, until every patriarch that we look to, every patriarch in the Bible that we honor, that we look to, every one of them without exclusion, walked with God, had to build God an altar without exception. The first thing that Noah does when he comes out of the flood, the first thing he does is not build himself a house, which would be the most logical thing to do. You have just come out of the flood. Everything is destroyed. You know, the first thing you want to do is build you a place to sleep. He understands God. He says, that's not me. I house without an altar. It's not a, it, come on, somebody. A house without an altar is vulnerable to all the demonic forces. He comes out and the first thing Noah does, man of God, is built to God an altar. And he gives God an offering that is, and then that altar begins to talk to God. You know, to begin to talk to God. The fragrance of what came from that place of exchange was so powerful that God smelled the aroma of this man's worship coming from an altar. By the way, God does not accept worship which does not come from an altar. And so it comes from that place. Come on, somebody. That's why you see, if a, if a, if a heathen, if a, an unbeliever sings amazing grace, it is not worship. It's singing. When you sing Amazing Grace, it's worship because he has already made your temple, your body into the temple of the Holy Ghost. So that's why heathens can sing songs of, of, of uh, gospel songs and go back to fornicating, acting like devils because to them it's a song, but to you it becomes worship because you have an altar inside. Because God does not accept worship from anybody unless there's an altar. I don't know who I'm talking to at New Covenant this morning. I'm going to change your economy today. Change your life. Because the altar is a place of exchange. I understand that. I wanted that. I could say a lot about the altar, but today God wants me to focus on the issue of exchange. So today I want to focus on the issue of exchange. Because some of your exchanges are pitiful. And that's why your life is full of drama. Because your exchanges are pitiful. But by the grace of God, God is going to help us change those exchanges. So I, I want, I'm going to, so I'm going to, so, go, so my message today is built in two modalities. The first modality, I'm going to deal with the power of having an altar in your home or your business. Then I'm going to tell you in the second modality, I'm going to end the message today by showing you how to build it. Because if you don't build right, it's not going to work. You've got to build it right. Because how you, you've got to build it and then know how to maintain it. But the moment you defile the altar, God won't come through it. See, God is very picky. The devil is not. God is very picky. The devil is not. You can give the devil anything. All the, all the devil wants is to get in your life anyway. It doesn't care if you are. It, the devil will take anything. That's why you find, whatever you find demons, there's dirt, there's everything. Demons, are, they don't care. They just want to come in. Because they know their time is short. So any entry you give them to work in your family, even if the, uh, whatever, doesn't matter. They were, I mean, come on somebody. I mean, are you catching what I'm saying? You know, demons will take a rat as a sacrifice or an altar. Demons, oh, I'll take the rat. Just, just let me come in. But God, God was even picky with the meat that you could put on. He was picky. He's picky. Someone said, God is picky. God is picky. Somebody, God is very picky. God is so how you build it and how you maintain it are important to him. How you maintain it? How you build it? How you maintain it? Because you know, the purpose of an altar is to bring God there. So when you, he comes and you come, 
the exchanges change your life. So, if you, you know, so I, I, in my book, I, I go into it, I have a whole chapter where I define what an altar is. There's no time for me to do that. If you're in the conference, you already got it. If you're not, buy the book and you'll catch up. But just understand that this is something powerful. It's about to change your life. And I'm going to give you real testimony. How my wife and I discovered the power. Because we never used to have it before. And we struggle with bills. This happens. This happens. She'll tell you. This happens. We love the Lord. And we, know we have great months and in bad months. Great months. I don't have any bad months anymore. Not financially. That's over. When I discover that. It, see, that's the power of the revelation. That when you understand the revelation, the power of the revelation comes upon your life. This is why the devil doesn't want you to have revelation. Because revelation in the kingdom, say with me, revelation is permission. Say with me, revelation is permission. When God gives me a revelation, say with me, when God gives me a revelation, he's giving me the permission to enter the domain that revelation controls. That's why Satan fights revelation. Because he knows the moment you have it, you have permission from God to enter now. And everything that revelation controls is your portion now. That's why the church needs revelators. Men that can level it. So you can come out of your troubles. So I'm going to give you three scriptures that the Lord, the Lord has given me on how to do it today. Go to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 6. I'm dealing now with the first modality. I want to just impress upon you the power of an altar in your home or your business. Have you noticed that when you go to a Thai restaurant, they have Buddha right in front of you? They're trying to tell you, you might be ashamed of your God, but we are not ashamed of Buddha. We want to tell you Buddha is running the company. You can eat all the, you can eat all the Thai, enjoy yourself, but Buddha is the reason why we prosper. That's what they're telling you. Then your businesses have no order and you wonder why your businesses is always in trouble. Because you're, ah, oh my God, I hope I'm talking to somebody today. <sighs> Second Samuel chapter 6 verse 5 to 12, something supernatural has happened. The, old, the Ark of the Covenant has been captured for years now. It gets lost in the days of Eli because of the, comprom because of the, comp because of the compromised priesthood of Eli. He's, he, he's, he had let his children run amok. They were philanderers. They were thieves. They were adulterers. They slept with every woman in a skirt in the church. They brought disrepute to the house of God. And when Esau was, when the Esau went to battle with the Philistines, they, you know, they, uh, Onias and Phineas took it upon themselves to take the ark of God into the battlefield, thinking that God was going to ignore their lifestyle and still use them anyway. But God is very picky. So when they get in the battlefield and they bring the Ark of the Covenant, understand this Ark is a dangerous Ark. This Ark of the Covenant is the Ark that on the shoulders of Moses, this Ark did dangerous things. On the shoulders of Joshua, they, the Ark made a river push back its water all the way to the beginning of the, of the river. This is supernatural. When the Jericho people are watching this in real time and everybody freaked out. When that altar got closed to the walls of Jericho, after seven days with that altar in front of them, the walls of Jericho, the thickest walls, bigger than the walls of China, fell down like they were rubber. This is the powerful altar. That when it comes in the battlefield, the, the Philistines talk among themselves. The Philistine, the Philistine generals talk among themselves. They said, what is that noise we hear in the camp of Israel? And somebody tells them, the ark of God has been taken from the temple at Shiloh into the battlefield. And the, the Bible says the Philistine general were terrified. And they said to one another, this has never happened to before. We are in trouble. And then the Philistine general began to talk about the, the, the profile, the, uh, the biography of the ark. They said, this is the same ark that destroyed the Egyptian. It says, they began to go through it. So by any stretch of the imagination, the enemy understands the power of a righteous altar. He understands it. So they went to the battlefield thinking they were going to lose. And Lord, to their biggest surprise, they won the battle with the ark of God in the midst. Because God is picky. 
He did not get involved in the fight. The ark was there. God never got involved in the fight because he despised the men that were carrying the ark because they were evil men. So that day, he let them watch. God was in the back. Can you imagine God in the battlefield watching Israel get killed? He's like, mm hmm. God didn't care. Nothing happens. And they take the ark of God to the temple of Dagon in Ashdod. So now, we pick up the story from there. So, but now, the ark has been gone for quite a while now that in the days of King Saul, Saul was such a fleshly man. King Saul was like, was such a fleshly man. All he wanted was what God, God could do for him. And you know, in the old time Saul was king, the Bible says, for we never sought for the ark of God in the days of Saul. See, there are ministries that can get away with sermons even if God didn't show up. I am not that guy. I got to have God or I walk out of here. I'm just not that. You see, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. But I, I'm telling you, I've been around the ministries. I know guys who can go on Google and, and download messages from people and then come and make you like, wow. But God knows it's Google. It's revelation by Google. It's not God. But, they, but, but people, are, people are never the wiser because we are also very emotional. We run and we shout and we scream. No one only, nobody gets healed. But man was a great message. So people can, so, so the souls in ministry can continue talking like the way without bringing God down, you know, and sustain their careers. But the ark is in Ashdod. So David comes and David says, no, I'm a different ministry. I come from that order of Melchizedek. I can't have a ministry that's not backed by the glory. So in the days of David, they go after the Ark of the Covenant. And so they are on their, they are now they are bringing it back. To they are bringing it to the city of David. David is so excited. If you read the Bible, he's like a little kid around the candy store. He's excited. He's dancing. I mean, the king is the biggest dancer in the party. Because he knows what's, up, what's coming behind. He knows it's the Ark of God coming back to town. He's excited. He knew this altar would change everything about him. Okay, he understood if the ark is in the city of David, everybody who comes after me first must deal with the ark before they even deal with my skills in battle. He understood. And so he's excited. But then something happens. Something tragic happens. But it shows us, but even the tragedy of what happens, I'm glad it happened because it shows us the power of an altar in the house. Check the, a physical altar in the house. When I say physical altar, I'm actually talking about a physical altar. <laughs> see, the altar in your... See, you're supposed to be an altar anyway as a child of God. The altar in your heart is for you. They're going to let your life. What told me, fans, is the altar in the house is for the house. That's the difference. Oh, but I can pray. That's not good enough. God is speaking. He loves dedicated places. <laughs> verse 5. Let's read it very quickly. 2 Samuel 6, verse 5 to 12. I'm going to read it. Very, I'm going to read it. Just get into your spirit because your life is about to shift. Your life is going to be exciting. My God. Hallelujah. You're about to buy cars and didn't even know how you bought the car. Hmm. And you're still not in debt. Hmm. Verse 5. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating and dancing before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir or cypress, wood with layers, harps, tambourines, cascades, and cymbals. Man, this, is, was a, this was a new covenant service right there. Everything. I mean, they were using everything. And Chris was in front just doing, directing the choir. The devil is a liar. Come on, somebody. Amen. Verse 6. When they came to Nacon's threshing floor, someone said, God is too picky. <laughs> but if you want to walk with him, you better get used to his pickiness. <laughs> Listen, I'll pray the price of God's pickiness for what happens if you keep that. When they came to Nacos threshing floor, Uzzah reached out with his hand 
to the ark of God, this altar. <laughs> the ark of God. And he reached out to the end because in his mind he's about to fall down. I got to stay dead. And took the hold of it. Because the oxen stumbled and nearly overturned it. Now in the natural you think, this is a good thing this boy is doing. But God kills the usher for even trying. And the, and the anger of the Lord, why would God? And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah. And God struck him there for his irreverence. The altars require reverence. I'm going to tell you later how you build these altars. Because of his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of God. David became angry. You know why David became angry? Because David did not understand. It didn't make sense to David. David said, the ark was about to fall down. But God kills Uzzah. Because if you go deeper, you find that Uzzah was not the Levite. And the law of the altar around that time was only the Levites could touch the Ark of the Covenant. But Uzzah touched it anyway and he died. And David became angry and grieved and offended. Somebody said, don't become offended with God. Tell somebody next to you, don't become offended with the Lord. <laughs> he became grieved and offended because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. Notice God never apologized to David. And that place has been called Perez Uzzah. Outburst against Uzzah to this day. Now look at verse 9. The power of an altar in your home is about to show up. God is so good. <laughs> so David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him. He was now afraid of it, which later will become a blessing. Because it shows, even though David was excited about the ark and bring it on, he had a casual attitude about it. So God killed somebody to tell you, are you next? <laughs> and David is like, hey... <laughs> I didn't know you. That's I know that's you watch this now. Instead, now watch what I, it was instead. Say with me, instead. instead. Ah, this is good. Instead, he took the most powerful altar, Pastor Chris. Instead, he took the altar. The altar that the Red Sea, the order the order that parted the river Jordan, Sorry. the order that brought down the walls of Jericho. He took it inside the house of a Gentile <laughs> by the name of Obed Edom, the Git the, the Gidetite. He was not even Jewish, but ha. Uh, he was not even Jewish. The altar comes into his house. So he, so now Obed Edom, a Gentile, ends up with the altar, the ark of God, as an altar in his house. <laughs> and God says, yes, I'm going to use the Gentile to show you the power of an altar in your home. And God says, you're going to leave me here, David? <laughs> you scared, eh? You're going to leave me up in, in this Gentile's house? You go. Me and this Gentile are going to have a lot of fun. I'm about to fill up his bank accounts. I'm about to give him, I'm about to give him Maserati's. I'm about to give him Bentley's. I'm, come on, somebody. Watch what happens in verse, verse 11. So the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Abraham. Abraham said, it was in the house. Say it again. Say, say the ark was in the house. Say the altar was in the house. Say the ark was in the house. Say the altar was in the house. So the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed Edom together for three months. I said just three months. Turn to one and say, God doesn't need a lot of time to bless you real good. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, I think it's going to take me another 10 years to pay off the mortgage. God says, what? (laughs) 
God is like, why are you talking like that? You know, come on somebody. Because the God who controls time, when the king shows up, time bows. Because the king is speaking. <laughs> so in three months, watch what God does to a Gentile who has an altar of God in his house for only three months. Only three months. Watch what happens. <laughs> Man, he's taking his children to private school. They are going to the best schools in town in three months. And the Lord blessed Obed Edom and all his household. You know what it means, all his household? Everybody, somebody say, everybody God bless. And all his household. Watch what happened in verse 12. The blessing had to be so enormous, so out, so supernatural. Because in verse 12, the news of how much God has blessed a Gentile because of having the ark for three months must have been huge because after three months, David came running. He's like, whatever it takes, I'm getting the ark of my God out of your house. I'm going to have some of this blessing that is in your house. The Bible says now King David was told, the Lord has blessed. Somebody say the Lord is blessing me. The Lord's about to bless me. Shout somebody, the Lord is about to bless me. Slap somebody and tell them God is about to bless me. It was told to David that the Lord your God has blessed the Gentile. He's driving Bentleys. He bought one. He just bought a Lamborghini for his wife. What? Yes. And you know his kids. Come on somebody. Even though they are mentally challenged. Yeah, yeah. He sent him to the best schools in town. What? Where did he get the money? Oh, it looks like the ark has become a good man in his house. <laughs> David loved God too much. It's like, you know what? You know what David did? He called all the Levites. He says, come here. What is he going to take? <laughs> what is he going to take to get that ark of God into the city? And the Levites, the rabbinical rabbis, got around David and they told them how Moshe had prescribed how the ark was to be carried. And Moses teamed up with the rabbis. And the rabbis told him, everything you do this. And David is writing, everything. He said, the reason why Uzzah died is because God never told you to put the ark of God on the back of animals. Because the glory must always be carried by the children of the kingdom. So the rabbi says, God doesn't need donkeys. He doesn't need cats. From the beginning, God said, let us make man after our image. He has always wanted man. How do you give him cows when Genesis 1.26 asks for man? That's why he killed Uzzah. He's like, I'm going to stay right up in here in the house of Ebed Edom. I'll bless this Gentile and if you keep me up here long enough, you'll become a billionaire. I'll keep blessing him until you realize what you did. When you come to me, David, you better come with men who are willing to carry my glory on their shoulders. Don't bring me some cow. I'm picky. Don't bring me your dog. Don't bring me your car. I don't need your car. I can give you a thousand of them if you just carry my glory. I need you. So when they came to take the ark, the rabbis were there with David. There were many of them this time. Every, it was to make sure. David was like, we're going to make sure. And the ark, they went to the ark. And the Levites, sanctified, consecrated, took the ark of God. And God says, yes, I'm about to go home now. This is how I'm supposed to go back to my country. On the shoulders of the Levites, consecrated unto God, holy unto the Lord, and they're saying, Holy is the Lord, holy is the Lord. This musicians, and God is coming back to town. He's like, Hello, baby, hello, everybody. I'm coming back. You know, I was in I was in I was in the Philistine, but I'm coming back home. Come on, somebody. That's how we came back with pomp and style. 
they brought the ark of God. And as soon as he got to the ark of God, David, David died without ever losing a battle in war. He died. Guess who was crying when the ark left? Obed Edom. <laughs> Trust me, if I'm over with Edom, I'm canceling all the credit cards of the wife. Because they used to have, they didn't, see, in those days, they didn't have wife. They had wives. I'm telling you, I am, if I'm over Edom, I'm like, what? You taking the ark? What? I, I can keep it for two moments. No, 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 no. You taking the ark? As soon as they take the ark, I just go online and I just cancel all the American Express of the wives. Shut down, shut down, because we are about to be broke now. Come on, somebody. We have to be now on a budget. <laughs> the Lord has blessed the house of Obededom and all that belongs to him because it was a because. You see, when the ark, when you have an ark, a sanctified, a consecrated altar to the Lord, the because is to not that what happens. After you build the ark of the Lord, the altar of the Lord in your home is not going to happen because of your paycheck or your skill. It will happen because of. He says this. He says the Lord had blessed everything about him because of the ark of God which was in his house. That is the only the bills were always paid on time. They took vacations. Went to the risk out on all the bills were paid on time. Not because they were smart. Because of the act of God. That was where? In the house. So, when God began to show me about the power of this. We were living in Scottsdale, which is a very, very fancy, fancy upper scale. One of the few, many people, they go to Scottsdale. It's very wealthy people. Okay. So we're living in Scottsdale. We found this place, beautiful place. In Scottsdale, it was, it was, a, it was a condo in a, on a very exclusive property, you know. And uh, we're living in it. And uh, we had this room. It was beautiful as you come through the door. And the Lord said, set that place as an altar for me. And so I set the altar. My wife, you know, she's creative. We had the menorahs in there. We had everything. We had candles. In a bobo, it's the altar. And every time we'll come through the door, we'll go straight and kneel before the altar. Before we touch the kitchen, we went straight to the altar and we talked to God at the altar. We always say, I mean, tell them where we went. We'll go for weeks. I'll come back. The first thing was we all went to the altar. Apparently, God liked this a lot. So, but you know how we, you, how we humans are? Because we are leasing the house. We say, ah, we're not having financial problems. We just, ah, you know what? It's because we're going to be buying a house now. We're going to buy now our, own, our own place. Maybe we need to save up some money. So we need to, you know, kind of, cause, you know, go away from this pricey place. So my wife, being a, a master of research, Amen. My wife can find deals that the Lord doesn't even know exist. <laughs> even Jesus will be like, Camilla, where did you find this deal? Come on, somebody. She's like that. So she found this. It was a beautiful place too. Except it was going to be about $1,500 less. Ah, okay. That means we're going to put away another $1,500, you know, because we're already used to paying at this price. So, okay. We'll put another $1,500 aside towards the house we're about to buy. We're thinking we are doing a pretty good job. We are being, we are being reasonable. We are being, we are being frugal. So, we saw this place. Everything looks good. So, we're driving back to the house, to the, to the, to the condo, because we're about a month before we had to decide whether to stay there or move. Now, ah, we're going to move there. We are, we, are, we are fine. So, we're driving back, and I never forget what, I never forget what God said. I'm driving back, and I'm thinking, well, are we talking, are we talking, but... And then all of a sudden, the Lord just jumps in the conversation. He likes to do that, by the way. 
Just jump right on in. And so are we talking? And then the Lord says, so you are moving. <laughs> I'm like, you got the email. <laughs> Lord, you got the email. So you are moving. And I'm quiet. Oh, yeah. But you know, it's the way he said, the so you are moving. I know. Oops. Something's about to go down. Some things that when he talks like this, it's got to go down. And by the time it's over, I'll be, I'll be crying. I'm so sorry. I know. I, because the way he speaks. But the way, so you are moving. <laughs> I said, yes. He said, then, then, then the next question. He said, so to save $1,500, you are going to move to that apartment. Which does not have an altar for me. I had not even thought about it. I was so excited. I didn't even thought about it. He said, which does not even have an, a place you can put an altar for me. And then he said, Francis, how worth is my altar to you? Oh man, I'm driving. I start to shake. And I said, Carmela, we're in trouble. I opened my mouth. Honey, we're in trouble. God is speaking. He said to me, Do you mean to tell me, son, for you to buy this house you're about to buy, which I have to help you buy anyway, <laughs> you mean I cannot continue to pay for the house you are in plus give you money for the next house because just to keep my altar? You think I don't have that kind of money? I said, Lord, you do. Then why didn't you ask me? And right there in the car, I repented and we both went into the serious repentance. And we went back home and signed another year of lease at the same place. And that's when God told me this, Francis. He said, Francis, the house altar pays the bills. It says, the house altar pays the bills of the house. That's why it's called the altar of the house. It's responsible for keeping the welfare of the house. Obed Edom was not blessed until the altar became the altar of the house. And then the altar says, okay, if I'm the altar for this house, Obed Edom, how much debt do you have? I've got 100,000 of debt cancelled. How much? Who, who are, who, I've been trying to get my children to, to college, but we don't have the money. Okay, take her to college. The altar begins to take care of the welfare of the house. God said to me, never forget this, unless you want to struggle with your bills. The altar that you consecrate to me pays the bills of the house. He says, Not, that's what the devil is so afraid of my people understanding the power of building physical altars that represent their consecration to me in the house. Oh, I have Jesus. I don't have to. Mm, have fun. God is picky. You can do that. You, are, you know, just remember God is not an American. Oops. God is not an American. So you can do it your American way and struggle with your bills your American way. But God is an ancient God. He says the ancient path. Return back to the ancient path. And then I'll give rest for your soul. He says I'm not returning to you. You have to return to me. Otherwise I watch you suffer. While I love you through your suffering. But if you want rest for your soul. Well you don't worry about your bills. Don't worry about your kids going to college. Come back to the ancient path. And one of the most powerful ancient paths. Is a building of an altar to the Lord. There's no, there's no path more ancient than the building of an altar to the Lord. Ask Abraham, ask Isaac, ask Jacob, ask Joseph, ask, ask, ask any of the people. Ask Mose, ask Elijah, ask Elisha, ask, ask, and ask Jesus. Jesus believed so much in an altar, on altars, he died on an altar called Calvary. There's no path more ancient than the building of an altar. 
So when we moved here to, in, Atlanta, in Atlanta, we, I mean, the first few weeks were very, very troublesome to me. Not because we're not in a, living in a very beautiful place. Because every time I would sleep on my bed, I felt guilty. I would turn and turn and turn. And I kept telling my wife, we need to put the altar quickly. I feel, now I feel nervous. But so now the altar is in place. So guess what happens? When I come, it calls me. It calls her. If I don't see her, I know where she is at. She's at the altar. Because the altar of the house calls you to prayer. That's why you watch Netflix until the cows come home. Because there's no order to call you to prayer. In your house. But when an order, it has an energy, it has a voice. You'll be passing by, passing by, watching your Netflix movie. And the order will say, Linda, Agnes, Karen, pause your movie. Jesus needs you. He wants some time with you. You don't even know. So, I don't, I, I, I'll, I'll come back. I just feel like I need to go to the altar. Oh, altars are powerful. They call you. Bam. And you're there. And before you know it, you are there for an hour. You are crying. And while you are there, he tells you, oh, by the way, this is going to happen. By the way, tell your child, I have this for your daughter. Bam, bam, bam. Wow. And, you, and then goes, oh, now go and watch your movie. But thank you for coming to see me. That's the author of the house. When me and Camilla cannot see head to head, we're struggling because husbands sometimes don't see head to head. Before we just hit each other like, ah. I know that some of you might find that as a miracle because my wife looks very innocent and very small. But I'm telling you, TNT can be packed in small packages too. She's powerful. In a good hotel. She's, this is, you know, I'm perfectly matched with Camilla. Let me put it that way. But when we have that, Go to us how to do it. So, okay, you, you can't agree. Don't worry about it. Both of you come to the altar. And we go to the altar. And never we go to the altar, we come back disagreed. The altar takes care of the problem. That's a part of house altar. And that's why the devil doesn't want you to have it in your house. So everything that comes in your house has to lie on the weight of your job. So if a bill, a phone bill is due, it lies on the weight of your job because the altar is not there. So there's no, see, in my house, when a bill comes, it lies on the weight of my altar. When a issue comes, it lies on the weight of my altar. But you and your, you and your, you and your bills come, they lie on the weight of your job. So you and your wife, you sit down around the table when the kids go to sleep, calculating with calculator. Shh, 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 shh. Are you, are you okay, honey? You, come on, somebody. Amen. Oh, well, my numbers, honey. We, I'm still coming up $500 shot. What are we going to do? Gonna do? You die by calculator. <laughs> we know what the order said to the order is calling. Come to me. Five minutes with me. It's worth a thousand dollars. Maybe that can add up. <laughs> you don't understand how much God wants to talk to you. He will exchange your bills for time with you. Oh, you don't know your father. He will exchange your anxieties for time with you. See, God can figure things out. He's got his own calculator. He's figuring out, you know what? You know, are you I'm saying? He knows, okay, she, she's worried about that bill. She's worried about that thing. But in spite of that, she came to me. So if I want more of this girl to keep coming to the altar, I need to deal with that. I'll give you one more. First Samuel 5, verse 1, very quickly. First Samuel 5, verse 1. Are you, are, are you enjoying this? Is this, is this? Am I helping anybody at New Covenant today? Because I'm, okay, one more thing. I'm, the power, someone said the power of an altar in my home or my business. Then 1 Samuel 5, verse 1 to 7. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and they brought it to, brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. They took the ark of God and brought it into the house 
of Dagon and set it beside the image of Dagon, their chief idol. When the people of Ashdod got up early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. That means while they were sleeping, the altar of God put Dagon in his place. God's like, you know, can you imagine God was having fun with it? Dagon on the floor, kissing the ground. God said, you look real, you look real God, right there. <laughs> put that picture on Instagram, somebody. So they took and returned him. So they came back. So they took Dagon and returned him to his place. This is very important. They took Dagon and tried to put him back again. See, if you have got debt in your life, that's a Dagon. That's a, a principality. That's something that messes with your head. Okay? So when your house altar is built, it goes to war. With every Dagon thing in your house. And because Satan knows that your debts is the reason he controls you. As God begins to pay your debts, he will try to put them back again. Uh, so God, God saw the altar keeps fighting until your devils are gone out of your house. Until the thing that kept you up at night, took your peace, is gone. The battle of altars continues until God says, I've totally taken over the house. I now own the place. They put him up again. But when they got up early, God says, okay, you never got the message that was being nice last night. I made him bite the dust, but at least he was alive. But this time, I'm going to break him like ISIS. Come on, somebody. But when they got up early the next morning, behold, Dagon had again fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord and his head and his head, that's ISIS stuff, head and both palms of his hands were cut off. And the Philistines, of course, were terrified. If you go into the story, it gets worse. Here's a point. Go said to me. Francis, the home altar fights the battles of the house. The reason you're praying a lot is because your altar in your house is not speaking. When I'm at my altar, I pray for nations, not over issues of my house. Because if I had an altar, it's supposed to take care of that. That is his battle. Whatever comes in the house, the altar must fight I need to fight everything when I move. Okay? When I'm, I don't need to hide about my eyes. See, the, the, God is telling us, Francis, that's what happens. Is the altar, the home altar, once you consecrate it to me. See, that's a part of consecrating an altar. Consecrating means you deliberately tell God, this piece of my property is yours. That's what consecration means. In this place, we won't discuss bills. We won't fight. We can fight in every place in the house, but not in the altar. That's the part of an altar because it conditions your behavior. Because God knows there'll be times when you fight in the bedroom. Your husband and wife, you just disagree so bad. Arr! And God says, yeah, they're fighting. You go to the kitchen. Come on, somebody. You are still fighting because your wife, when she cooked for you, put too much salt in the food. Just to make you feel it. So you're still fighting. You're like, how come there's too much salt? Well, you want, you want to put some more? You're still fighting. So what happens if warfare covers every room? God says, come to the altar. Because it's the only place that's conditioned to break you into submission. Because that place in your house belongs to Jehovah. But if you don't have an altar, every place of the house, warfare breaks out everywhere. Until he's getting the car, he leaves. You get in your car, you leave. And the house says, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> but when the altar is in the house, you notice, I know this. When you consecrate a place to the Lord, your own mind consciously knows. I just gave that to God. So I can, I can, I can act a fool outward, but I can act a fool there. Because that's the power of an altar. 
It conditions an atmosphere in your house that can never be taken by the demonic powers. And that atmosphere. So maybe you don't have a, but Dr. Mouse, I don't, I'm, I don't have a big house. I don't have a, a house I can dedicate to the Lord. You better take those stupid jackets out of, the ja out of the closet and throw them in the trash can if you have to. And make that, I don't care if you only feed by yourself. God doesn't matter if it's in a closet. If you say, this is now the house of the Lord. This is the altar of the Lord. I'm taking all this stupid, all this stupid, come on somebody, winter clothes. Get out of here. Come on, somebody, I'll put you in the garage, but I'm going to consecrate this little closet. Jesus told us that. Little closet, it will belong to the Lord. I tell you, baby, that little closet will be more powerful than any room in your house. It will, it will be, it will be what, it will be what Jacob said. I, I, I was in this place and God was in this little place and I didn't even know it. Surely this place is the gate to heaven. Anytime I want to go to heaven, anytime I'm tired of my hell in my life, if I get in this space, heaven is going to come. You need a place in your house that is not controlled, an atmosphere. It's not controlled by devils, not controlled by your habits, not controlled by your moods. It's an atmosphere of heaven. If you come in that place, oh, the warfare goes away. Oh, the warfare goes away. And God begins to stalk. And by the time you get out of that closet, and what a humble God we serve. That just to have an altar in your home, you take the closet. Because philosophically thinking, in the mind of man, that almost sounds demeaning. Because God owns everything. But to have an altar in your home, you exchange a closet. You exchange you get the clothes. You exchange place with your coat, with your coats that you put there for winter. When you take them and put them in the garage and you clean it up and you sanctify the place, God will say, "I'll take that room." But but believe me, you me from that room, I will fight for everything that happens in this house. I will fight. I will fight every Dagon spirit. I'll fight witchcraft. Now notice, if you go down in the story of Dagon, when Dagon was destroyed, the altar kept fighting. Which is interesting because Dagon has been destroyed. Why is the altar fighting? The altar was now turned fighting from Dagon to the people who worshipped that spirit or carried that spirit. And God gave me a revelation. He says the altar not only deals with demons trying to get into your house, it will also fight people with wrong spirits who come in your house. Hey! I don't care what you're carrying on them. You come to my house, you are living with your demons. They don't stay with me. Yeah, you can be a witch. You come in my house, you can have my food and I'll bless you and love you. But when you leave, you and your witchcraft are living together. Because my altar won't let you stay. It protects the house. Are you with me, somebody? Now let me end, let me end the service to show you how to build it. Can I do that, pastor? Do I have time to do that? Just to give you a couple of points on how to build it. Can I, do, I don't know how to build it now. You now know what it does, is all right? But can I tell you how to build it? So you can build it and maintain it. Very quickly, it's only how to build it. Jesus gave it to us himself. How to build it, how to maintain it. All given to us by the Lord. Please go to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, I believe it's Matthew chapter 6. From verse 5 to 18. Matthew 5 verse... Matthew 6 verse 5 to 18. Also when you pray... See, notice the Lord doesn't say if you pray. He expects you to pray. The 
biggest lie is that prayer is for intercessors. Prayer is for believers. So essentially, it comes down to one thing. If you don't pray, you don't believe. If you don't pray, you don't believe. Because if you believe that if I pray, God will move, I'm going to pray. If you believe that if, if I pray, God will pay my bills, you will pray. So people don't pray because they don't believe. Because prayer is for believers. So Jesus assumes it in the package of believing. Also, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. He's telling you how to now to maintain the house order. Do not be like the what? The hypocrites. For they love to pray publicly. Standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets. So that they may be seen by men. I talking about how to keep a home or how to... Come on somebody. So number one, the Lord is saying, come on somebody. He's trying to show us here to maintain the privacy. He's telling us, first, first he's telling us this, he's telling us, amen? He's saying one of the things that can destroy the power of a, of a home altar is a spirit of showmanship. In other words, when you consecrate an altar to the Lord, don't tell everybody, every Jim and Jack, what happens in there. The home altar is not there for you to go and, you know, come and say, to go and show everybody else how spiritual you are. It's, between, it's a place of intimacy between you and the Lord. Don't behave like the hypocrites, he said. Okay, watch this now. But when you pray, when you pray, go, everybody say go. That's an action word. Go means you can't stay in the same place. Go is an action. Go where? In your most private room. Ain't nobody better than Jesus at prayer. And he's telling you what to do. How to maintain. Go in your most what? That means the home altar cannot be public. So even if you don't have room in your house, go to, go to Home Depot and buy a tent and put it in a corner of your house. Because when you are in there, nobody should see you. You don't have the excuse. Let me do something. You don't have the luxury of saying my house is too small. Because if you believe that Satan will have you fighting for everything for the rest of your life. In the name of my house. No house is too small not to make room for the creator. Jesus says go in your most private room. So when you come to the house we are staying in right now in McDonald's. You come, the altar. Raymond, where's my son Raymond? Stand up. The people, that's, the, that's my son Raymond right there. Okay? Raymond is the one that helped me build my altar. Is that right? He put some nice curtains, black curtains. Because black makes sure you can't see through. So we built a nice, this, and guess what? You can build. We know where we got it. It's simple. We got, now you can take these things that, that, that you can hang um, curtains from the, from, they have got Laura's. You have no excuse. I don't care if it's in your living room. If that's the only place, make, go to Home Depot. Uh, oh, but it, but it looks, but it looks ugly. He won't, you know, I'm a decorator. Uh -huh. Stay with your decoration and them bills messing with you and them devils. You can have fun. But that block, he built something for us. And when I go in that, behind that black curtain, the presence, oh boy. It's like nowhere else in the house. Because it's the altar. Go in your most private room. Close the door. That means don't let nobody see you. This is not about you showing people how spiritual you are. The home altar is not to show God how spiritual you are. There's nothing about you God doesn't know. Close the door. What is he saying? The word close the door implies 
It implies God saying, I want you by yourself. So a lot of times she goes by herself because just because she's my wife does not mean she stopped being his daughter. But there are times God calls us to the altar together. But in God's eyes, there's still a oneness because the two shall become one. But the essence of what Jesus is saying, close the door, is God said, close the door to everybody. Close the door means don't go in your altar with your cell phone. Close the door because a cell phone is another world in your altar in a digital platform. That's why your friends can call you. God said, why are you having Shekwit, Tequisha, Shenene calling you when I'm talking to you? Why is Shenene calling you? Why did you bring the cell phone? Because that's another world in the altar. You are defiling the altar. Leave your gadgets. Leave them. That's another world. Close the door. And let me talk to you about your life, your destiny, about us. Close the door. Close the door. Close the door. This is Jesus. Close the door. No Facebook, no Twitter, no Instagram. Just you and Jesus. This is the power of the house order. It's jealously guarded by God's presence. It will fight a cell phone. You're like, oh, I love you, Lord. He don't feel, what is it? He's like, what is the cell phone doing in here? Huh? Oh, yeah, sorry. Get out. The altar speaks. And then well, as soon as you, you get rid of something that, that offends the altar, the God of the altar, his presence, shh, and you feel it. He says, yeah, now we're talking. And then it begins to deal with what breaks you down, what makes you cry your hopes, your dreams, where you're supposed to go, what he has for the house, what he has for the kids. He talks on the altar. He has never changed. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 14 says, for we know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it or taken from it. The altar is God's doing. It can never be taken away. It shall be forever. Are you with me? Close the door. And then when you are in there, pray to your father. What does that mean? Lord told me a secret. He said, Francis, he says, you are never going to know the father driving around. You might touch him. If you know the father, go in the altar. He introduces the father. What is he saying? Father, is waiting for you in your secret, most private room where you close the door to all the world except Father. He's waiting for you. That means that's where your identity will be resolved. I'm not good enough. Daddy will kiss you, give you one kiss, and you'll be healed forever. And you think you're the best thing since sliced bread. Because in the secret place, Daddy kissed you and said, what are you talking about? Come over here, baby. He kissed you on the cheek. You get out of there. You believe you can do anything. And you're delivered. He's telling you, you cannot know my father behind the secret places. The Holy Ghost might meet you in the crusades, in your car, but father loves the secret place. <laughs> Nobody knew the father like the one who came to show us the father. He said, the Holy Ghost can, can go to the crusades with you, not the father. He behaves differently in the Godhead. He's the one who gives destiny and identity. To give a child identity and destiny, you must separate the child from everybody else. The order, home order does that. He says, go there and talk to your father. Talk to your father. What is he saying? That the house altar, the purpose of the house altar is not to bring your bills into the equation. Because God assumes if you attend to the altar, he who attends to the altar eats what the altar eats. So eventually it's going to eat your bills. So when you go to the altar, it's not really to discuss about your problems. He said, but just talk to your father. Then he says, for your heavenly father knows. Someone said, my heavenly father knows. It's now say everything I need. 
For the Heavenly Father knows everything I need. He said, for your father. Notice. This, this, for the father who is, not who sees. For the father who is in secret. He's, he's locating the father for you. He is in the secret room. The day you built the altar, father came down and that's why anytime time you want to meet father, who is in secret. Who is in secret. <laughs> For your father who is in secret, check this out. Who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you where? Publicly. So one day you come to New Covenant drive, driving a Maserati. When, when you used to drive a Honda, that need, a Honda Civic that needed prayer every time you drove it. Come on somebody. Every time you prayed, you had to pray. You know, the, the, then one day you come with a Bentley. Wow, you come with a Maserati. What happened? As you've been spending time with the Father in secret, He's been changing your economy. Now we get to see what happens in secret publicly. That's the power of altar. And you're about to have it. I'm going to pray to you. I'm going to lead, in, a very, in five minutes, I'm going to have everybody stand and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. To repent to the Lord, the Father, for not honoring the altar. For not valuing the secret room, private secret room, close to all the world. Close to all the world. Except you and God. And when you pray, do not, he says, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they think that they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, praying as they do. For your father knows. What you need before you ask him. What is he saying? He says when you go in the, the home altar. It's not a place for you to impress God. Or here's what he's telling us. He's telling us when you are inside the home altar. Don't talk a lot. Because it's not what you say that will change you. It's what he says. That's what he's saying. The Pharisees thought. They are meaningless bunch of words was what God made God move. And the whole time God says, if your mouth will just stop talking, I can give you one word. One word can, can bring your daughter home. I can give you one word that can change your business plan like that. But you keep talking meaningless. And meaningless means words without purpose or energy. They are not part of the divine concept. Yeah, so in other words, you are speaking, but the father, all the father hears in the spirit is a dissonance. Now she is in music. She knows a dissonance. A dissonance is, remember the choir is singing and somebody is out of tune. You are enjoying it, but not people with a trained eye. They are like, oh my God, somebody get, so they go to the back. That's why now people who control music, they go to the back, silent, while you guys are excited, and they mute the button of the one getting the dissonance. God says we should keep chapa, 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 talking even in tongues. God is like, okay. What is it about tongues? I don't know. What is it about words? I don't know. I'm just waiting for you to. Because in the secret place, I know what's hurting you. I know what messes you up. I can deal with it if I can just talk, but you keep. And many of us, what we call secret time, is us blabbering on God for one hour. And then when God is about to say, okay, let me know. Okay, it's over, it's over, it's over. God said, what? It's over? You have been talking for an hour. I'm about to talk. No, it's over. Uh, thank you, Lord, for an amazing private time. God says, I was just about to tell you 
that if you go to the Starbucks right now, you would meet your husband. He's rare right now. I was about to tell you that. So I'm learning more about the home altar. Gus is telling me, Francis, pray in tongues as much as you want to everywhere. When you get in the altar, keep quiet. Because I've heard, you, I've heard your voice everywhere. If you're like me, I pray everywhere. I've heard that too. <laughs> when you come in the altar, I, shut up. Because the whole day, thank you. When you come to the altar, so in the altar, you know what's happening to me now in the altar now? I cry a lot. Sometimes mucus coming out because God is delivering me from stuff that are deeply seated. He's telling me, do this tomorrow. This is what's going to happen next year. But this is how I want you to do it. I'm talking less and less and less and less and less and doing more and more and more. Because every time he speaks, you do more. Every time he speaks, you become bigger. Every time he speaks, you become greater. Every time you sp he speaks, he kills the weakness in you. And it becomes this. Every time he speaks, power is released. For the Bible says, the Lord is king. And whatever there is the word of the king, there is power. Stand up everywhere. I'm going to pray to the Lord. God's about to change new covenant. We're about to have a people who are radically intimate with Christ. If you build the warm altar, we are going to know. Pastor is going to know because you're going to come in here looking like Moses with the glory shining off your face. Come on, somebody. You are not going to come on, somebody. You, I, I know you just, I, you can lie to me. me men, we mean and women who are faithful attendants to an altar of the Lord, I can't hide it. They can't hide it. They look like the altar they spend time with. They look like the God of the altar they spend time with. You're about to change. You're about to change. Be still and know that I am God. 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 Let me stop talking. Be still and know that I am Jehovah Tiskid, you know, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Ra Jireh, Jehovah Shama, Jehovah Shalom. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I you my child I know that I am God keep talking he says stop talking he says stop talking I've heard you now you hear me because when he speaks he doesn't just speak to you he speaks to everything it's going to take for you to shift. So when God says in the secret place, son, I've blessed you. Oh, it's big. It's big. He didn't just speak to you. He spoke to everybody in creation who's holding the blessing. At that very moment he told you I've blessed you. They are moving towards you. Let's lift our hands as we come before the Lord. 
One of the things the Lord wants me to talk about, if you go deeper in the, in the text, I'm not going to preach it, I'm just going to say it so I can make it part of the prayer. Jesus warns against bringing the spirit of unforgiveness in the sacred place. He tells us that there's, in other words, he identifies the number one cancer that can change the climate and the atmosphere of the altar in your home. Is coming into it with a heart that refuses to forgive. If you keep going to the altar and, and desecrating the altar with unforgiveness and you do it enough times, one day you go in there and God would have left your closet and it's just a closet again. It's useless to you and to anybody. And the demonic powers will be the first one to know that your house is no longer protected. Because God will simply, if you want to sanctify my name, I'm going to leave because I'm picky. Holiness means I'm different from your cousins. I'm different from your fathers. Don't treat me like none of them for I am God and I'm not a man. And I will have holiness by those who come near me. Moses, there is a place by me. If you can live in holiness, there is a place. So I dare not go before the altar. But if I do go before the altar with unforgiveness, I dare not leave the altar with unforgiveness. I will snort, I will cry until the unforgiveness has left me. I'm not leaving the altar. It's dangerous to leave the altar of the Lord with unforgiveness. I will stay in there if I need another hour. If it so, so hurts you and you can't forgive, maybe you need to be there a whole day. It's worth it. But don't you come out until you're forgiven the person that needs to be forgiven. That's how to say that. Lift your hands now and say, Heavenly Father, I bless you, Lord. For there is none like unto thee in all the earth. Pray with me. Say, there is none like unto thee in all the earth. You are exalted. High and lifted up. You are the rose of Sharon. The lily of the valley. The star of David. Brighter than 10,000 suns. In you there is no shadow of turning. Even with all of that. The angels are ascribing worship to you 24 hours. Bowing before you. And saying, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In all of that, you still long to spend time with me. So how can I fail? Say it with me. How can I fail to build you a consecrated place that is just for you in my house? To let you know you are welcome, Lord. Father, forgive me for not having built an altar, a sacred room where I can close the door on my cell phone, my iPad, my computer, and on everybody else so I can be with the King of the universe. Forgive me, Lord, for having failed. To consecrate unto you an altar. But that changes today. I've heard the word and I obey. And a new season will begin in my house. Lord, as I consecrate for you a holy place, a consecrated room for you, Lord, I'm asking God that you go after every Dagon spirit. That has been messing with my home. Stealing my money. Stealing my joy. Causing drama in the house. Every day gone spirit. Will now have to leave my house. Because the altar of Jehovah. Will now be a resident altar. In my home. In Jesus name. If you believe that give the Lord some praise. Our God is champion.